You already share your screen. Um, so welcome, Harvey Gosa. Um, so you can already share the screen and maybe five minutes uh, before the end, I will just give you a sign through the chat, okay. just like five minutes left. And uh, yeah, so the stage is yours and we are all very excited to look forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, it's wonderful uh, to be part of this uh, event. Um, the organizers invited me to speak about DFT, RDMFT, and I was uh, careless enough to, to add another topic, but I realized that, uh, well, each of those three topics will easily um, fill um, a whole lecture series of its own. So I'd rather probably, uh, depending on time at the end, uh, stick with the first topic, which is DFT. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I come back uh, to the uh, uh, very first uh, uh, day uh, uh, in the introduction that Christian made, he uh, said that there's these two possibilities of dealing with the many body problem. On one hand, one can try to evaluate the wave function in one way or another, or one can uh, uh, not attempt that, but rather uh, do a functional theory uh, where one writes the total energy uh, in terms of a simpler quantity, and then uh, one uh, minimizes this total energy functional as a functional of, of this simpler quantity. Um, so that's the basic idea of functional theories. Now, what you choose as your uh, basic quantity, there is some, um, some possibilities, and I've listed here the three most important ones. So on one hand, you could choose the density, that's DFT then. One could choose the one body density matrix, that is an RDMFT. And, and this is not so well generally appreciated, one could also choose the one body greens function as your simplified quantity. This is more known under the heading many body perturbation theory. But if, if you think about it, this is also a functional theory. So the quantity that ultimately you have to approximate is um, in the case of DFT, as we all know, the exchange correlation energy as a functional of the density or the exchange correlation potential directly. For DMFT, it's the exchange correlation energy as a functional of the density matrix. And in the case of many body perturbation theory or Green's function, functional theory. It is, uh, for example, the self energy, which plays the role in the Dyson equation, the role that in the Cohn-Sham equation is played by the exchange correlation potential. Now, if you compare these possibilities, one can say that to find a good approximation for this functional is actually quite easy. In the case of Green's function, functional theory, one of the most uh, powerful functionals is G times W. So this is really a simple functional if you think about it, right? G times W, that's easy. Now for, uh, uh, for density matrix functional theory, the construction of approximate functionals is difficult. And I would say for DFT, it's even more difficult. Now for the numerical effort, it's just the opposite. For Green's functions, it's very heavy. Um, RDMFT is moderate, and for DFT is relatively light. So that's the, the comparison of the two. Of course, the basic quantities here, the Green's function, the one body density matrix, and the density are related to each other. And this is sometimes useful. Uh, so the density matrix is the equal time limit of the Green's function and the density is the diagonal, diagonal of the density matrix. Now, the essence of density functional theory can be summarized in these two well-known statements. 
first statement is that every observable quantity of a quantum system can be calculated from the density of the system alone, at least in principle. So once you have the density, you can get everything from it. And the second statement is that uh, the density of particles uh, of the interacting system can be calculated as density of an auxiliary system of non-interacting particles that move in an effective potential. So this is really the content of the hohenberg cohn and cohn cham theorems um, for which Walter Cohn got the Nobel Prize in 1998. Now in a bit more mathematical form, hohenberg cohn means that there's rigorous one-to-one -one correspondence between the potential and the density. Density here means ground state density. There's a variational principle. So it says there exists a functional of the total energy such that uh, uh, the variational principle written down here gives you the exact ground state energy and the exact ground state density. Now, um, as a third statement, and this is exactly the point that was discussed heavily in the previous talk, the universality, this functional here, F is universal, there's one and only one functional for all Coulomb systems. Now the Cohn-Sham equations are just a corollary, uh, one could say, to the homberg cohn variational principle. If one writes the total energy functional in this way, where T sub S is, is the kinetic energy of non-interacting particles, the variational principle gives the Cohn-Sham equation. Now, at, at this point, I like to uh, uh, make a quotation of Walter Cohn, uh, where he says that the Cohn-Sham equations are an exactification of the Hartree mean field equation. So Cohn-Sham equations have the shape, they look like a mean field theory, but in a very well-defined sense, they are not an approximation, they're exact, namely in the sense that these equations give you the true density of the interacting system. Okay. Now, uh, in the time-dependent case, um, when you have an external driving field, there's a similar theorem, uh, the analog of the homberg cohn one-to-one correspondence can be formulated for the time-dependent case as well. And the resulting time-dependent Cohn-Sham equations look like this. The density, the time-dependent density of the system is obtained by the sum of absolute squared of time-dependent orbitals that are obtained by propagating in time the, uh, this single particle equation. And the effective potential here, like in the static case, consists of everything that is external to the electrons. So that would be the static field of the nuclei, for example, and uh, let's say an electric uh, field, um, and the time-dependent half term, and an exchange correlation potential. Now, like in the static case, the Time-dependent Cohn-Sham potential is local in the sense that it's a multiplicative operator in the Cohn-Sham equation, in the Schrodinger equation, but the dependence on uh, the density of that functional here, of the exchange correlation functional, that is generally non-local, both with respect to space and with respect to time. So meaning that the potential at point R is determined by the densities at all other points uh, R prime and at uh, the point T in time, it's given by uh, a, 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 in principle non-local dependence on all previous times T prime. And again, it's a universal functional at least in principle. Now, I want to uh, make a statement here uh, about this universality. So it's uh, in a way, uh, continuation of, of the, the, the discussion that we just had. So this universality, is it a curse or is it a blessing? So I would say it's both. So on one hand, it means there's only one functional, just one functional that needs to be approximated. Right? So once you have a good approximation to this function, you're done, right? Everything is, is solved, so to say. Um, which also tells you it's kind of hard to find good approximations 
of that kind that work for everything. And if you look at the history of DFT, it kind of took a long time. Uh, even the first step from the LDA to the GTA took 25 years with many groups being involved. So it's not a simple thing. Now, there is a, a general misconception that uh, the exchange correlation functionality of DFT cannot be systematically improved. That is not true. There's many ways of doing this systematically. There is, uh, for example, like in many body perturbation theory, there's expansions of the functional in the coupling constant. Uh, there is uh, semi-classical expansions that can be highly accurate. Um, but there, there is systematic ways, but it's an approximation to the functional. What does that mean? It means that the results will improve on average for all systems. But the systematic improvement for a single given system, the one that you may be interested in, that's not possible. That lies in the nature of the theory. Right? You can only improve the functional, right? You can improve on average for all systems, but you cannot possibly do what you can do in wave function theory, improve for that particular system that you're interested in. So that's a, a conceptual difference. Now, also all of you know this, uh, uh, the five levels on which one can uh, uh, do uh, functional theories. So first level is the basic theorems. We are done with that. Then next step is to deduce exact features of the functional and then a good way of finding approximations to this universal functional is to include in the functional approximation many of these uh, exact features that you have deduced in level two. Now, another uh, important task is then to write an efficient code that solves uh, the Cronsham or time-dependent Cronsham equation. And then, only then, you can run the code for interesting systems. So, we are, we are done now with the first level. And now I'm going to uh, uh, say uh, a few uh, things about other levels for specific questions. So functional approximations, I think of ordinary DFD, there's now more than uh, 300, um, each one deserving a little bit of, of comment. I cannot, and I don't want to do that here, just uh, I want to mention this uh, famous Jacob's ladder of approximate functionals of John Perdue uh, that makes this classification in LDA, GGA, uh, meta GGAs, hybrids, and uh, RPA like functionals. That uh, uh, and the, the, the explanation is, is, given, is given here. So uh, in this highest level, you have a dependence on the density, gradient of the density non-interacting kinetic energy and occupied and unoccupied quantum orbitals and energy. Now, um, there is one important aspect and uh, this refers to the description of uh, uh, quantum phases like magnetism and superconductivity. And this is the following. Let's first look at magnetism. So the quantity of biggest interest is the spin magnetization density or the global magnetic moment of the system. Now, remembering the hohnberg kohn theorem tells you that in principle, you could represent everything as a functional of the density. In particular, the spin magnetization also by virtue of the hohnberg kohn theorem is a functional of the density. However, that's not the way you do it. And the simple reason is that this functional magnetization as a functional of the density, there's no good approximations for that. So a way around this is to include the magnetization as a basic variable in the formalism in addition to the density. 
So we start from a different basic Hamiltonian where in addition to kinetic energy, electron-electron interaction and external potential, we have a Zeeman term where the magnetization is coupled to an external magnetic field. And then one can prove a Hornbeck cohn theorem and one can write the total energy as a functional of these two densities. And then the variational principle gives you a cohn sham scheme and uh, this then has, in addition to the exchange correlation potential, an exchange correlation magnetic field, which is the functional derivative of the exchange correlation energy with respect to the magnetization. Now, for the simplest case, where both the magnetic field and the magnetization only have a Z component, then one can deal with just spin up and spin down densities with respect to this Z component and the density and magnetization are given by these simple formulas. But that's just a simplification, one doesn't have to do that. Now, now comes an important point. If you now want to describe systems that do not have an external magnetic field, so just ordinary magnets that are magnetic without an external polarization, polarizing field. So then, we let the external magnetic field in this equation here go to zero. But then these equations do not reduce to the original density only cohn charm equations if the system has a finite magnetization in its ground state. So it means you have basically two ways of, of dealing with magnetism, either with the original density only formalism, but then you need the functional of magnetization as a function of the density, or you include this order parameter, let me call it the spin magnetization in, in the formalism directly. Now, the same thing can be done for superconductors. So that's the basic idea, namely to include the order parameter that characterizes superconductivity as an additional density in the form. This was proposed long time ago, but like always in DFT, until you have really good functionals, it takes some decades, and I'm going to show you results in a minute. Now, if you think of ordinary phonon-driven superconductivity, you also need to somehow include the nuclear degrees of freedom as an additional density. And um, this is done in the following. First, um, uh, let me say what this order parameter is. That's a well-known belief, I would say, that all superconductors are characterized by off-diagonal long-range order of the two-body density matrix, which means that two-body density matrix in a very specific limit that is given here, the average of the first two and the average of the second two, difference of those two averages going to infinity in this off-diagonal limit, um, if then the density matrix factorizes, these factors are the order parameter of superconductivity. And when you allow for uh, eigenfunctions that are not eigenfunctions of the particle number operator, you can write this order parameter in this particularly simple form as expectation value of two creation operators or uh, two annihilation operators. So that's the order parameter. Uh, that characterizes superconductivity, and it's believed that this is uh, the characterization for all super superconductors. Now, we do exactly the same thing like for magnetic systems. We include uh, uh, this order parameter in the basic Hamiltonian and let, let, in the end, this coupling term go to zero, this external field. So this is like m dot b, this is like the Zima term, and delta is a pairing field, so it's really perfectly analogous to, to uh, the magnetic case. If you imagine um, an interface of a ferromagnetic and paramagnetic material, then uh, the ferromagnetic side produces a B field which polarizes uh, the paramagnetic side. So it makes the order parameter non-zero in the vicinity of the interface. And likewise, if you have a superconducting, normal conducting interface, the superconductor produces the pairing field which makes in the vicinity of the interface, the normal conducting side a bit uh, superconducting and that's known as proximity effect. So it's totally analogous. And then uh, uh, this we have to include uh, 
for the nuclei, so that's nuclear kinetic energy. And um, we include as an additional density the nuclear n body density. So that's written down here. We have three densities ordinary electron density, the order parameter, and the nuclear n body density. One can prove this is now at finite temperature uh, in thermal equilibrium, the one to one correspondence between these potentials and these densities. And one can deduce cohn equations, and they look like this. So the electronic degrees of freedom are now described by a bogolyubov degen type equation with effective potentials. This is an ordinary um, um, scalar cohn potential, and this is a, a pairing potential, and those two depend on the three densities now. And then there's also a nuclear equation, which involves an n-body interaction, and this nuclear equation reproduces the nuclear n-body density. So this is very similar to Born-Oppenheimer, right? This is like a Born-Oppenheimer surface. And this is also the way you deal with it in practice as a, as a full many-body problem. You never solve it, but rather you expand this potential around the equilibrium positions to second order and then solve this in harmonic approximation. So this is the non-interacting phonons that come from this equation. Okay, so formally, this is still exact, uh, an exactification to quote Walter Cohn of the bogolyubov degen mean field equations in the sense that they give you the right order parameter and the right density. So now for the first time, I will tell you how one can construct a functional. And this is done with many body perturbation theory with uh, Feynman diagrams. So, uh, and this is a specific version of perturbation theory where you choose as non-interacting system, as unperturbed system, the Cohn-Cham system. So this is Cohn-Cham electrons, superconducting Cohn-Cham electrons. Here's this Cohn-Cham pairing field, and here's the, the normal uh, Cohn-Cham potential, plus you have uh, non-interacting phonons. So that's the unperturbed Hamiltonian. And then you, on the basis of this unperturbed system, you uh, can define normal, in the normalized electron propagators and the phonon propagator. And then you can draw your diagrams. And one point is obvious. There will be diagrams that contain the phonon propagator, and there will be diagrams that do not contain uh, the phonon propagator, that are purely electronic. And we need to find approximations for both of those. Now, the phononic part is given by these diagrams. So remember, this is uh, the, the phonon propagator, and this is uh, this anomalous Green's function, electron Green's function. This is the normal electron Green's function. Never mind the details here. Um, what you need to evaluate this functional is the so called Eliasberg function, K and K prime resolved, which one can do. Uh, we do that with the quantum espresso code. So this is, so to say, an input. Now here, and this is a very important point, we are in a unique situation where we know what the dominant diagrams are. This is a consequence of Migdal's theorem that says that, that uh, these vertices here carry uh, a prefactor of square root of electronic over nuclear mass. So we do have a small parameter here. We know what the dominant terms are. This is hardly ever the case in, in the purely electronic many body theory. But here, this is a very favorable situation. Now, for the um, electronic part of the functional, we use uh, this term here. Remember, those are the anomalous diagrams. Now, the wavy line here is not phonons, it's the electronic part, but it's an RPA screened electron electron interaction. Since those are the anomalous propagators, you see immediately that this term vanishes once you are above the critical temperature and you're just left with uh, an ordinary GGA type density function. So that's our functional. No choices, no, no adjustable parameters. Once you, you have written down this approximation, the only thing is you have to look what comes out. And here's a result. This is several phonon driven superconductors. And uh, uh, black is, is experiment, green is our calculation. 
And um, you see that, uh, so those are calculations of the critical temperature. And the critical temperature is easy to calculate from these equations. You just look at which temperature the order parameter goes to zero. That's the critical temperature. And uh, you see that it agrees extremely well with experiments. Right? So that's um, uh, a general thing that we find for, for hundreds of other materials that we uh, um, have a very accurate way of, of predicting critical temperatures of superconductors, which are ordinary phonon driven superconductors. In addition to that, um, the, order parameter, the order parameter itself is an output of the theory, right? So it's an, a non-local object. So it's useful to write it uh, uh, instead as a function of the average and, and uh, difference coordinate. And if you plot it, for example, here as a function of, of the average coordinate for, for vanishing difference coordinate, this is for magnesium diboride, you can nicely see that, that uh, the order parameter, so superconductivity actually resides here in, in these very strong sigma bonds. Right. So this is really a, a local statement. We, we know where superconductivity is strong and where it is weak. This is another case. It's a lead monolayer on silicon. You see here that uh, this proximity effect produces a metallic band of, of silicon, which is superconducting. And uh, uh, as you can see, this opens the, the possibility to, to tailor locally the order parameter. Right? So we can, in a nanostructure, at will make locally uh, uh, the superconductivity stronger than at other places. And this is, in fact, uh, possible also experimentally. So I was involved here in this, in this experimental paper. OK, so for superconductors, phonon-driven superconductors, we, we really have a marvelous theory. It's, it's really the gold standard this functional that I showed you. And the deeper reason why this works so well is that here we have a small parameter. We really know to a very good approximation, it's a controlled approximation, uh, what the functional is. Now for magnetism, we don't have that. So magnetism is much harder than superconductivity. So we do not have, and that's still the status quo, we do not have sufficiently accurate uh, exchange correlation functionals to calculate the, the, the query temperature. Just we don't have. Them. And also, if you go beyond the, the, the simplest materials like iron, cobalt, nickel, magnetic moments with standard functionals like LDA, GGL are often not accurate. You will see a few numbers in a minute. Now, um, here for the improvement of, of the magnetic moment, we actually designed recently a novel functional. And uh, it follows the route of, of constructing improved functionals by including uh, exact features, features of the exact functional that we believe are important. Now, in, in the magnetic case, the exchange correlation magnetic field uh, can be shown to have this property. So that uh, is discussed in a paper a long time ago. And um, it tells you that the exchange correlation magnetic field is really like an ordinary magnetic field. It can be written as uh, the curl of something. Now, if you think about it, this condition is actually violated by all standard functionals, LDA, GGAs, and so on. It means that the approximate exchange correlation magnetic field is actually in these, approximate, in these approximations, LDA, GGA, is produced by magnetic monopoles. Well, it's a fact. Um, whether one should worry about it, well, one could argue, well, exchange correlation potentials are kind of constructs, they are not physical. But still, we do know the exact exchange correlation magnetic field is a curl of an exchange correlation vector potential. So we set out to fix this and uh, it's actually very easy to do. 
So we use Helmholtz theorem, which tells you that any vector field, for example, the BXC in GGA uh, approximation can be written as the curl of something plus the gradient of a scalar. That's possible for all vector fields. And the simple idea is to enforce this exact property here by subtracting this term. And that's actually easily done. So how we do that, we, we uh, take of this equation, the divergence, so divergence of curl disappears. Here we get a Laplacian. So we end up with this equation. And then imagine we have just our ordinary GGA functional, which contains source uh, uh, contributions. And we calculate this function phi of r, the scalar field, just by solving this Poisson equation. Right? That's easy to do. So now each, each Concham code has a Poisson solver, so that, that's easy to do. Once we have phi, we just subtract from the uh, ordinary GGI, GGA, BXC, the gradient of that function. That's it. Sorry, sorry Harvey, the time is up. Or okay. More? Uh, no problem. Um, uh, I, I'll wrap up in a couple of minutes. So we take the gradient of, of this, subtract it. Now this alone, in fact, we had this idea already 20 years ago when we worked on this exact feature. This alone is not enough. It turns out that if you just do that, what is the second line here, you end up with magnetic moments for all systems that are too small. Well, how can we fix that? And that was uh, the idea of Sangita Sharma. Let's just multiply the, this BXE with a scaling factor, make it a bit bigger. Now, if this scaling factor would be system dependent, then it would be no good. And right? this would be then really a fudge factor. But it turns out it's not. So it's largely the same number for, for all systems that we looked at. And we just choose it such that iron cobalt nickel comes out right. And that's this value then for, uh, for S. And now I'm going to show you results. And after that, I, I wrap up. Um, um, so what is plotted here is the error in calculated uh, magnetic moments of a number of solids. So you see the error is very small for standard iron cobalt nickel. And what is given here is the error for uh, LDA and GGA. So we use PBE there. And, uh, and this is an experience that, that we made is that once you go away from the simplest ferromagnets, actually the magnetic moments of many more complex uh, magnets are terribly bad. So you can see that here, errors of, of 300%. Terrible. Now, if you make this source-free uh, construction that I showed you on the previous transparency, um, what you then um, get is a, is a reduction everywhere. Right? So here, pretty good. You're also pretty good. There are two systems where it's not perfect, and those are known to be strongly correlated. And as you all know, the poor man's way of dealing with strongly correlated systems is to uh, do a DFT plus U calculation. Now, this is then for these two systems. Um, um, if you just do LDA or GGA plus U, you still have very large errors. But if you then do the uh, LDA, the source free construction that I showed you, plus U for LDA and GGU, you, you get uh, this again very accurate results for magnetism. So this is once again a demonstration that by including exact features, you can really make progress. And I have a, a third topic, which, um, yeah, I should probably stop. Um, we'll, we'll, you, you tell me, it will probably take something like, like uh, five minutes or so. Um, <laughs> Maybe it's better to continue with the questions. 
So, so we have now five minutes left for the questions, and I think okay. there will be quite a few. If it's okay for you. Okay. 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 So, thank you very much uh, for this uh, very nice talk. Uh, I think uh, if now five minutes for questions. Uh, so please raise your hand or just directly ask. Them. Quite a few questions or Sabre. Yeah, thank you for giving this general talk. I'd like to ask you for comments on how to write the entanglement as a functional of the density. Okay. That's not so easy. <laughs> I'd rather do this with uh, uh, natural occupation numbers or something like that. But um, there is, I, I, I remember that there is a paper by Klaus Capella on, on this question. But I don't quite remember how, how exactly he did it. I always like confused because I mean here we talk about uh, a single density where entanglement is by nature is not related to a single density, which is really hard. Well, to, uh, anyway, I mean, I mean, if there is a paper on this, I will appreciate it. So. Yeah, I can I can look up the reference. So the, the author is is Klaus Capella, but uh, I want uh, since you asked this question. Um, I want to make a, uh, uh, an important comment here that when, when one says, can one write a certain quantity as a functional of the density, it, the, the word functional is, is always to be understood in a, in a rather general sense. So it's not an explicit, usually, especially for complicated quantities like an entanglement entropy or something like that, it's not a, a functional of the density explicitly, but rather functional of the Kohn-Sham orbitals and orbital energies. So this is then, since the orbitals themselves are functionals of the density via the Hohenberg-Kohn theorem, right? you, you, you always uh, uh, can um, write functionals of the orbitals and orbital energies, uh, and those are also density functionals in this more general sense. Thank you. Maybe it's just one thing I briefly would like to add to, add to this uh, for Sabre. I mean, maybe although it's not the, the kind of system that you are interested in at the end, but because matter physics, they even study non interacting fermions, translation variant systems. Uh, and then there you can still discuss spatial entanglement, of course, between the left and right half, like us in DMRG. Uh, and there, of course, because of the fact that you have no interaction between the particles, uh, you have kind of this powerful link between the one part where it is density matrix and the quantum state. Because the one RDM determines the slated determinant uniquely. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is Weyerwitz theorem. You have this nice link that we take the one RDM, you need to restrict it then to the left half of your system. And this allows you up to exponential or logarithm to calculate the entire entropy of the left block. So maybe this might be a good starting point, although there's no parent action involved. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So Gustavo, you also had a question. And then also Sebastian. Hey, hi, Harley. Nice talk. Hi. Um, wanted to ask you: Have you tested the uh, your superconducting uh, functional on 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 electronic driven superconductors like cuprates or nictites? So for for nictites, um, it actually works well if you describe the magnetism of of these systems well. So in, in many of the plictite materials, you have a competition of superconductivity with magnetism. And this was actually a, a, a painful lesson to me that especially for those systems, magnetism is described really badly. And in fact, uh, the, the examples that I showed you here, right, um, those are all from this class, right? So they are the, uh, many of those are the parent uh, materials of, of midnight superconductors. So once you, once you have the, uh, a good description of magnetism, you can also get the, the together, taken together with uh, the, the functional that I showed you for the superconducting phase, you get a good answer. Now, 
um, this is not true for the strongly correlated systems, in particular also not for the, uh, for the high TC cuprates. So this formalism DFT for superconductors is generally valid. So in particular also for the, for the cuprates, but you need a good enough personnel and, and we don't have that. So I have not yet fully given up. We are working on that, but okay. We are not there yet. We tried the functional for calcium copper oxide and we get uh, 0.1 Kelvin as critical temperature, so totally off. So this was really, for me, well, this was the proof that it's, it's not four knots, right? So clearly it's not four knots in these materials, as everybody also believes. Yeah. All right, thanks. Good, thank yeah. you. Last question comes from Sebastian, hopefully short answer, if possible. Okay, so hello. Hey, thanks Hi. fellow for this talk. I really like it. Actually, I learned a lot and it connects with some concept that I had before. Uh, it is half question, uh, the, or no, can't half question, half comment, perhaps you, you would let me to understand a bit better. That formalism in which you can uh, model magnetism or superconductivity by using these additional densities. So this parallel formalism, uh, does it have something to do with that picture proposed by Anderson some decades ago that we can understand superconductivity as an ISO spin that stops being a domain wall from the Fermi C to the empty levels to um, vice field that, that you know that tilts uh, continuously mm -hmm. they spin from up to down. So does it have something to do in that way with that picture? Uh, well, there also you have this kind of locally varying order parameter in a, in a domain wall. Mm -hmm. So it, it is related, yeah. Yes. And then in that way that for the magnetic picture in the magnetic problem that you have this problem of the monopole, uh, Perhaps I'm wrong, I, I don't know. That field that you can introduce in superconductivity uh, can be modeled as produced by a monopole. So in that way, if you use a similar formalism, it's, uh, for me, it's just to let me understand. Understandable that you also get a monopole field uh, by using a similar formalism. So in that way, you should subtract it as you showed in the last part of the talk. Ah. And actually, okay. it really works. <laughs> <That's the slide laughs> so, that is oh, this this uh, superconducting pairing field, which is the analog mm -hmm. of the magnetic field, mm -hmm. is really not in, in the formalism that I showed. It's not a vector quantity. Mm -hmm. So so, yep. so it's not really, a, a, there's no monopole contributions. Okay. And so it's, it's just analogous, mm -hmm. but um, there's nothing to subtract. Okay. In the interest of time, let thank us you. continue by also thanking again speaker Ed Harley. It was a nice presentation. And then it's now Mario Piris who will continue. Um, Mario, please. Uh, I hear. 